Christmas. It is an awesome time to be together. My name is Trey Postel. Uh, I get the pleasure of serving as a student pastor here at Tomball Bible Church. So if I've not had the pleasure of meeting you, uh, man, I would love to meet you afterwards. And if you have words of encouragement, if to this time if we study together, if God's word blesses you and encourages you, man, I'd love to hear from you. And even if you have moments of, hey, brother, you're too loud, or hey, man, you went a little long, man, I would love to hear from you as well. Best way to do that kind of uh, critique, if you will, uh, would be just to email me. My email is david at tomballbible.church. So, The topic this morning is peace, the topic of peace. For many of us in the room, the idea of peace, we look a little something like this. Yes, all together, let's say all. Aw. Aw, yes, that's my little boy. That's Deacon, he's two. You may have seen him running around the lobby. Uh, he's the one with the, the head that you could play the Super Bowl on. It's okay, I admit it. He gets it from me, it's all good. But for many of us in the room, this is our idea of peace. Calmness, it's comforting. We're at a, we're at a posture, our circumstances are, we're good, we're good. And, but for many of us in the room, when this is disturbed and when we, life gets a little rocky, it gets a little hard sometimes, it gets a little uncomfortable, we've all probably more than likely prayed the prayer that Jesus said in the boat, peace be still. So we ask Jesus, would you please calm the storm? Would you let peace be still? And for many of us, for many of us, including myself, that prayer has not been answered. It has not been answered. And instead, our prayer may turn to something like Psalm 88, which is a psalm of despair. A psalm of, okay, God, what is going on? Or it may turn into Psalm 13, which says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? And for many of us in the room, the holiday season brings this sense of uncomfortableness in us. We'll be around family members who just, they like to poke and prod a little bit. And you pray the prayer, how long, oh Lord, will Uncle Trey be here? How long, Lord? But for many in the room, this is a hard season. This is a season, maybe this is the first Christmas without a loved one. Maybe this is your first Christmas in a new place. So it's confusing, it's hard. Maybe this is the first Christmas where You'd hoped to have a baby. And it's a hard season. It can be a hard season. And yet in this season, what Jesus invites you and I into is peace. But peace, as the scriptures would describe it, is not circumstance-based. So the scriptures would not equate peace and circumstances in the same category. In fact, the word for peace, shalom, all right, it's a Hebrew word, can literally be translated to be complete or to be whole or to make whole. It's a completely different idea than what we understand of peace being circumstance, being comfortable. The Bible does not put peace in that category. The Bible puts peace in a position or a posture of the heart. Now, many of you have probably seen the movie Jerry Maguire. My favorite quote from Jerry Maguire is, show me the money! So, um, we'll take up the offering again right now. I'm joking. But there's a scene in Jerry Maguire where Jerry goes to Dorothy's door and he is trying to convince Dorothy of his love and his affection for her in the hopes that she will also return a favor. And the famous line is said, you complete me. In Tom Cruise's very dramatic non-alien movie, that's what he does. You complete me. Some husbands in the room right now have, may have even said that to your bride. Let me just that bubble real fast and to say, your spouse does not complete you. In fact, I would argue your spouse, husbands, your wife actually makes a really crummy God. She cannot satisfy the deep parts of your soul. That's not her job. It's not, how, it's not why that gift of a spouse was given to you. Wives, don't say amen. Your husband makes a really crummy God. He was not given to you to satisfy the deep parts of your soul. 
God is a giver of good gifts and he gives us good gifts, spouses and children and jobs and places, our happy places, whatever the case may be. But the gift was never intended to replace the gift giver in our lives. And we seek peace in these places, in these people. And all the while, God wants to draw our attention back to himself. He wants to draw our eyes, our hearts back to him to see that true peace, true wholeness is found in Jesus. I have two goals this morning. So here you go. So if, you, if you're looking for, okay, what do you want us to walk out of these doors and the response is we walk out of these doors. Here you go. Be, you ready? I want you to be in awe of Jesus. I want you to be captivated by Jesus. I want you to be in such, such a state of wow with Jesus. And in being in that, that motivates you. Being in awe of Jesus, that then motivates you to pursue the peace that is in Jesus in Christ our Lord. In the time that Jesus was born, it was the Roman Empire. Rome is by far the greatest juggernaut of a dynasty the world has ever known. They ruled the known world at that time. And the emperor of Rome at the time that Jesus was born is Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus has a title attached to him in his uh, emperor status, okay? And his title is in fact, ready? The prince of peace. He is credited with ushering in peace during the Roman reign. He is credited for bringing peace to the entire Roman empire. And then that empire in and of itself would reign for thousands of years past him. But he is called the prince of peace. Rome, in fact, had its own gospel. The gospel of Rome said this, submit to Caesar, believe in Caesar, submit to the kingdom of Caesar, Rome, and you will have joy love and peace. And the way they maintained that peace, the way they maintained their gospel was through the end of a spear. So you came against Rome, you met that spear, you met the oppression, you met the, the, the sheer power that this dynasty had. And yet the true Prince of Peace, the true Prince of Peace, King Jesus, he enters into the Roman Empire. I love the providence of God and the humor of God for God to send the Son, Jesus Christ, in a day and age where if you came against this empire in any way, shape, or form, they were very quickly to annihilate you, get rid of you, be gone, and they were good at it. The true Prince of Peace comes in with his kingdom, his upside down kingdom, different than what the world had known. And the true Prince of Peace would not win his conquest with a spear. No, brothers and sisters, our Prince of Peace willingly took the spear on our behalf. That is your God. The Jews in this day were looking for someone to come in and be like, be like this conquering king, this conquering Messiah. They would overthrow the Roman government and establish their kingdom. But that was not the agenda of Jesus. It wasn't his agenda at all. No, his agenda was to usher in wholeness, to usher in the posture and the condition of our hearts to be right before God, before others, and in the world. This is the kingdom that Jesus ushers in. So as we enter the holiday season, and we talk about how Jesus fulfilled our peace. Like, what does that exactly look like? How do I have peace in the midst of the hardship that this holiday season can often bring? How do I have peace in the circumstances that I find myself in right now? How do I have peace, even though all seems to be going well, how do I maintain, how do I pursue the peace that is offered to me? Would you be in awe of Jesus? Because it is in Jesus that that peace is found. If you would take your Bibles and go to John 14. We're gonna take a 5,000 foot view of the entire upper room conversation. So John 13 to John 17 is the upper room uh, conversation that takes place. And this is Jesus teaching his disciples in his last moments before he would, he would go into the garden and pray and be taken to the cross. This is a very intimate and a very heavy conversation that Jesus has. 
It starts in John 13 with Jesus knowing all things had been given to him, had been given into his hands. So Jesus perfectly understands who he is. And yet he willingly puts on the role of the slave and washes his disciples' feet. So when he says the words, the servant is not greater than the master, which he'll say a few times in this section, what he's saying is if the master is willing to wash the feet of the guests, so should his servants, so should his followers. And he does this with Judas. So Judas is still in the room. John 13 then transitions where Jesus gives, again, a hard dialogue. One of you is going to betray me. And everyone's confused, like, what are you talking about? And they miss, I would argue they miss the cue, if you will. Ultimately, that was just the spirit of God blinding their eyes and their hearts to what Judas was about to do. Judas then leaves and John 14 begins the conversation with the disciples. Now, as we read this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try and feel the weight of the moment. I want you to try and feel the, the angst, if you will, of what these men are hearing their leaders say to them. Would you feel the weight of the guy that they have followed for the last three or so years, and all of a sudden he is saying some things that are hard. And then in that same way, would you be in awe of Jesus and the comforting words of your God? John 14, we'll start in verse one, and then we'll go all the way down to verse seven. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I would go, I would have told you, so would I have told you that I go to a prayer a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. So the first thing, Christ has fulfilled our peace. So we're calling this whole series Fulfilled, the Advent season of Fulfilled. Christ has fulfilled our peace by being our peace with God. Now, if you've grown up in church world for a while, you probably have heard that phrase, you've heard that taught, whatever the case would be, but that is a daunting, like that is a miraculous thing when you think about it. The Bible depicts you and I in not great terms, okay? So all the way from back in Genesis 3 to current state 2021 right here, we live in a broken world and our hearts are fractured, are broken. The state of our condition is that we are sinful. Romans 1 through 5, if you were to just uproot Romans 1 or Romans 3 by itself and separate it from the rest of the context of the Bible, mankind is doomed. Doomed. No hope. Because this, in Romans 1, Paul's writing about, these, about, about people who are lost and separated from Christ and that they have decided to worship creation rather than the creator. And God has given them over to this passion. That is, that is, that is dark. That is hard. And yet, all of us in the room, apart from Christ, that is our condition. That is our condition. In Romans 3, Paul's quoting from the Psalms. And the line, the last line in his, in his Romans 3 dialogue, man does not fear God. Like that, that, that boggles my mind. So this semester in student ministry on Sunday mornings, the students and myself, we've walked through the attributes of God. And of all the attributes of God, there is one attribute that the rest of his attributes stand on. And that is that God is holy. Leviticus 19.2, speak to all the congregation, the people of Israel, and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God is different from us, Tomball Bible Church. God is different from us. In all things, God is 
different from us. Man, in our times, we have attempted to bring God down to our level to make him more relatable or relevant in this hope that we love others, we enjoy others, and all the case would be. The command is to love one another, but the command is not to diminish God. No, the command from God is, no, 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 you come to me. Be holy as I, the Lord your God, not me, God, as God is holy. And this is the God that we stand against in our, apart from Christ. We are hostile to God. We are an enemy of God. Again, if you took Romans 1 and Romans 3, lifted them up by themselves, mankind is hopeless. But the greatest conjunction in the Bible is still there. Brothers and sisters, the greatest conjunction in all of scripture is still there. The greatest conjunction is simply this, but God. Would you see the immense mercy of your God? Would you see the immense grace that God has for you? But God, Romans 5 would say this, but God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us us. And because that is true, Romans 5, 1 is true. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God by doing good works. Ooh, my bad. That ain't what it says. Let's try it again. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through living a good moral life. Hmm. Track two. Okay, here we go. Brothers and sisters, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Not by nothing you and I can do, not by any merit of anything that you and I bring to the table. We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way to the Father. Brothers and sisters, you and I are made right with God and we are at peace, we are whole, we are complete before the perfect, holy God because of what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. Jesus is the way to the Father. Jesus is our peace with God. And in that peace, in that moment of being made right with God and having peace with God, there is something that happens in our relationship to God. Six times in the John 16 passage that we'll get to here in a moment, six times Jesus refers to God as Father. Father, the Father, the Father, the Father. And he invites his disciples and you and I to also call God Father. A Father in heaven who will not abandon us. This is Romans 8, 37 through 39. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If the, there's, there's, a, there's a check there, through him who loved us. You have to go back to Romans 8, 32. Which, which simply just states that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us. So God loves us through the son. The passage continues in verse 38 of Romans 8, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. There is no way the Father God will abandon you. He will not leave you in your own accord. He is presently with you at all times. We also have a Father in heaven who completes his work in us. So the work that God has begun in you from the moment of your salvation until present day right here, December the 12th, 2021. Sorry, I had to look at the date. Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this that he who began to go work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we have a father in heaven who will not sin against us. He will not wrong us in any way. 
but he invites us in our unfaithfulness. He draws us in when we are unfaithful to him. This is 1 John 1, 5, and then 8 and 9. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse nine, if we confess our sins, he, being God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have a father, Father God, who sits in the heavens and aims aims his steadfast love and his faithfulness at us so that we, his children, can in turn glorify him. Psalm 115, one through three. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Why should our culture question, where is your God now? All this and that's happening, where is your God? Christians, follower of Jesus, where is your God? Where is he? Oh, our God, he's in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. What does it please the heart of God? When we glorify his name, because we're motivated to glorify his name by his steadfast love and faithfulness for us. You've been made right with God. You've been given peace with God and you can now call God Father. Jesus changes the relationship. It's no longer enemy and hostile. It's no longer one who fears, does not fear God. The state of not fearing God is this idea that that I'm, that I'm somehow smarter, that I'm somehow better, that I somehow have it all together. This is, I'm good. I don't really need you, God. And so you tell the God of the universe who gives life and sustains life. That, let's think on that for a second. You're, you and I, I'm breathing right now because my brain's pumping. It's telling my nervous system to make my lungs go up and down. I'm not a doctor. I just think I know how it works. And yet in all of that, God the Father is sustaining me. It's not on my own abilities. It is by God himself. You where you are, God sustains us, all of us, right here, right now. And so when we say we do not fear God, we spit in the face of the very one who sustains life, who gives life, and in a simple voice, life is gone. And yet that all-powerful, almighty, gracious and kind, perfect, holy God invites you and I who are broken and fractured into himself. And the title is no longer hostile. The title is child. The title now becomes daughter, son. Because of Jesus. Because the son of God was willing to take the spear on our behalf. This is the God that we serve. This is our king. This is the true prince of peace. And then there's the role of the Holy Spirit. So John 14, 25 through 27. These are Jesus' words. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The promise of the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Ghost, is that he guides and instructs us in how to live in this peace that is found in Jesus. So Jesus Christ is giving us his peace, has made us right with God, and the Spirit of God guides us in that peace. Now that's gonna come in real handy here in a moment. We'll get to that more in a second, but would you think about this, that God not only grants us peace with himself, but then he indwells us and guides us in that peace. He didn't just leave, he didn't throw his hands up and be like, best of luck to you, mate. Have fun, hope it works. No, the spirit of God indwells our lives and leads us to understand scripture, leads us in prayer. In the moments when we don't know what to pray, God himself prays on our behalf. That is comforting. 
That is peace. That is to be made whole. And this is the work of God on our behalf and giving us peace with God. Because here's the other reality. I've already mentioned it. Everybody in the room, you're going to go through hardships. You're going to go through trials. I don't, I don't, as a student pastor here, I don't, I don't sugarcoat the reality of the brokenness of the world that we live in. I do not sugarcoat the realities that students in today's climate face. Because it's more than just popularity. It's more than just social media. I mean, it's, there's some, it's hard. The world can in fact be a very cruel place to live. And for some of us in the room, the circumstances surrounding us are cruel, are hard, are difficult. And yet, our God is with us. Think of, use your imaginations and think of the room now, the upper room. Jesus is talking with his disciples. And he's having this conversation. And the angst that's filling their own hearts, that's filling their own minds, and the stuff that's swirling around in their own brains. And the tension is thick and it's hard. They don't really know what's going on. They're hearing statements like this. This is John 13, 33. Where I'm going, you cannot come. They're hearing statements like John 14, 29, and 31. And now I've told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Or John 15, 8 through 27, where he tells them that the world is going to hate you because it hates me and the Father. Merry Christmas. The world's going to hate you. Follow Jesus. The world's going to hate you. Be blessed. Man, that's just the greatest Christmas message of all time. We could have just stopped right there. This is hard. I like being liked. The disciples probably liked being liked. And he keeps going. 16, John 16, 5 through 6. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. They're sorrowful. Their leader is saying, I'm leaving you. I'm going somewhere that you cannot go. Well, why not? Why not? I'm the oldest of three boys. Like, I was the leader. And so when I told my brothers, you can't come with me, well, why not? Because I said so. Followed very quickly by my mother saying, take your brothers with you. <laughs> Joy. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. What? For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Do you feel the, the angst in these statements? Do you feel the, the shaking in the room? This, this is not easy. They didn't have all of John's gospel with them yet. John's in the room. For you and me, maybe the angst in your heart is the doctor visit you have to go to and you don't know the results of the test yet. For you and me, maybe the angst is getting a call from the school saying we need to talk to you about your student. For you and I in the room, maybe the angst, maybe the, the thing that <gasps> is not knowing where a loved one is because they're living in sin and don't know what's going on in their life. Look right up here at me. Not a person in this room is above your phone going off in your pocket and the conversation on the end of that line dramatically changing your life for the rest of your life. There is no one above your phone buzzing and your life being altered. No one is above it. For me personally, having received that phone call at 4.36 in the morning saying that my brother had been killed by a drunk driver, this was two years ago, you don't think the angst in my own heart rises in that? You don't think that the angst in my own heart rises up in me and to say, okay, God, where are you? 
what's going on? Why is this here? As a guy on stage, I'm not, just, I'm not using those illustrations just for kicks and giggles. I'm a real person who also has walked through this space of asking God, what are you doing? What are you saying? Much like the disciples, what are you saying? What, what do you mean we can't go with you? What do you mean we can't go to where you're going? For us in the room, we're asking God, God, why can't I know? Why can't I be a part of? Why can't I fill in the blank? And the promise of Jesus to you and me, the promise of Jesus in all of those moments, in all of that space, the promise of Jesus is John 16, 33. You know it, you probably have it memorized. Let me just read it out loud for us all. I have said these things to you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He's talking to us that in me, you may have peace. How, why? Because in the world, you will have tribulation. In the world, you have sorrow. In the world, it will be hard. But take heart. I have overcome the world. The promise of Jesus in this moment right here is that he has won the war. He has won the battle on our behalf. The promise of Jesus is that he goes to war alone and comes out victorious. He says it to them early. He says, the one who's in the world has come. He's talking about Satan in that moment and Satan's naive attempt to overthrow the purposes of God in the cross of Christ and Christ rising again from the third day. Jesus is the only person who's ever walked into a war by himself and walked out of that war victorious. Busted open that grave and said, I win. I win. And it is through his victory, it is through his conquering, it is through his work that 33 is true. In me, in Jesus, we have peace. Brothers and sisters, you can go to that doctor's office, whole, peace. Because Christ has overcome the world. You can get that phone call from the school and show up to meet with the teacher or the principal and be at peace. Why? because Christ has overcome the world. I can walk through the sorrow that I walk through my family. We can walk through the sorrow that we feel. And guess what? We're at peace because of what Christ has done. Christ has defeated death itself. Hear me. That does not mean the pain just goes away. That does not mean that the conversation won't be hard because the first reality is still true. In this world, you will have tribulation. You will have sorrow, but it's in the midst of the chaos. It's in the midst of the hardship that you and I can have peace with God and in the world. And he doesn't end there. This is Ephesians 2, 11 through 19. So I'll give you some quick context. Ephesians, the people of Ephesus are an extremely diverse group of people, ethnically, socioeconomically, the whole nine yards, okay? And they are a large group of people. One would argue, some, some people would say, <coughs> not COVID. Some people would argue, <laughs> dry throat. It's okay, I've been talking for a while, my bad. That Ephesus in and of itself is big and it's large and, it, and that there's, 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 there's chaos because when you try to bring a whole bunch of people into a room together and to come up with one common idea, like that's, that, that's, that screams chaos, okay? That screams bad. It's, and if you think of it, just think of it in the respect of your own marriage. Two sinners coming together in holy matrimony before God with your own ideas of what a perfect marriage looks like, with your own concepts of what a holy marriage looks like. And guess what? Very oftentimes, they ain't the same. And so peace is what we're after. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 11 through 19, and he says this to this very diverse, large, and different group of people. This is what he says. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is 
our peace, who made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Brothers and sisters, we can have peace with God. Christ has fulfilled our peace by being our peace with God in the world and lastly with others, with the others around us. I'm new here, I'm the new guy. And I've, and I've I try my best to listen to as many stories as possible. And yet for so many in the room, there's stories of unpeace and unsettledness in us. Past hurts, what it gets to mean, they always, almost always involve other people, other believers in some instances. And that's not everybody in the room. I'm not saying that about this church. I'm just saying about across the globe, a Christian church at large, oftentimes believers hurt other believers. We say things that we don't really mean, or we say things we do mean, and it's hurtful. And what Paul is commissioning this group of people, and this is why he calls out the Gentiles in the first place, because he's really speaking to the Jews. Hey, Jewish brethren, these Gentiles, so Gentiles, you who were once far off, alienated from the commonwealth of God by Christ, you have been brought into the fold. To give you a quick context of Jewish history and how Jews and Gentiles mixed, they did it. There was no mingling, there was no party get together, there was no, there was no office party where you saw that person who you really don't like at your office, but you went there anyway. And like, oh, I guess I'll endure this. Like, they just didn't do that. They just didn't show up to the party. So and so's coming, no thanks. Peace out. That's a different kind of peace. But the Spirit of God through Paul says, no, 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 there is no more of this tension. There's no more of this heartache. There's no more of this my side and your side. There is one body. We are all one nation in Christ, citizens of a greater kingdom that is to come. Therefore, live and pursue the peace that is found in Jesus with others. Run after the peace of Christ in your life that Jesus has given you and that peace then comes out of you towards others. Again, this does not mean that it's rose colored glasses and that all things are hunky dory. There's conflict, there's tension, but the goal is to be united. The end goal for the kingdom of God, for the citizens of God is unity. The goal for us with other believers, both locally here and across the globe, is to live in harmony at peace with one another in Christ Jesus, because it is Christ Jesus that is our peace. So brothers and sisters, Jesus is our peace. He's fulfilled our peace. We live in the two advents of King Jesus. This first advent has come, Christmas, yay. And the second advent is coming. In the first advent, he came as a baby. In the second advent, he comes as a conquering king. And much like Augustus, who tried to establish peace by means of conflict, by means of war and oppression, our king, has already won the war. There is no battle left to fight for him. There is no more, there isn't a second cross he's gotta go endure. No, my friends, he's already won. For us, in the now, living in the already but not yet, you've heard that terminology, living in the already but not yet, in the now, right here, our Prince of Peace is not a sleeping child. Our Prince of Peace is not calling us to live these comfortable, easy lives. No, our Prince of Peace 
the true king, calls us to live in his peace that he has given to us. And it is by his peace we are at peace with God, with the world, and with others. This is what Christ has fulfilled.